Uh, our first speaker is Jörg Schmalen from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Uh, he'll talk about strain manipulation of multi-component order parameters. Welcome, Jörg. Yeah, thank, thanks to all the organizers uh, for putting together this meeting, which has been so far uh, real fun. Uh, this uh, work today was uh, done together with, uh, primarily with uh, four collaborators, Matthias Hecker, He's a graduate student in Karlsruhe. He used to be until recently and was supposed to be in the US already and for obvious reason is gonna stay a little longer in Germany for the moment. Roland, uh, Roland Villa is a postdoc here in Karlsruhe. Raphael, you know, and Rolf Lotz is an experimentalist uh, from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology with whom we did some collaboration on experimental topics, which is quite obvious. So this is basically two topics I want to discuss today. Uh, one has to do with a story that we have been discussing for a number of years, initially in the context of the iron-based systems and then in other systems uh, that goes under the name of vestigial or composite order. And the reason why I thought it might be interesting to discuss it here again is because there's some very nice experimental uh, work uh, that and theory work together that seems to make a case that composite order is an interesting scenario. Um, and uh, the second part, if I get there, will be an unpublished work with Roland and Raphael, where we uh, make an alternative uh, proposal for what might be the origin of the time reversal symmetry breaking state in strontium ruthenate. And of course, the subsequent talk by Andy McKenzie will go in much greater detail about the beautiful physics of this material. This is old stuff. Um, if I want to talk about an order parameter, I go back to the 1937 work from Lev Davidovich Landau, and I learned that uh, what I want to do is, if I look at, um, for example, some order parameter in this initial case of the density of solids um, or solid formation out of a liquid, then I expand in terms of the irreducible representation of the underlying symmetry group. If that's a higher dimensional object, I have a multi-component order parameter. And then I use some group theory and indeed find that uh, there will be a degeneracy in that order parameter family in the leading term of the ginsburg lander expansion. And that's what all this uh, is about, about uh, additional symmetry breakings that may, might occur uh, in multi-component systems, uh, where you can imagine if you have a multi-component order parameter, you can combine it in a multitude of ways um, and build composite objects that would transform non-trivially uh, something that requires you to have a multi-component object. And if it transformed uh, non-trivially, you might break an additional symmetry like chiral symmetry breaking, time reversal symmetry, uh, superconduct, um, yeah, other charge for superconductivity uh, or nematicity, for example. Just to, to put this again in context, uh, often you have a situation where you have some sort of frustration or fluctuation uh, that suppresses or at least suppresses for a while uh, the actual order parameter to condense. And uh, the most exotic and most interesting case might be the one where you never really order and form a liquid. And uh, a little bit more conventional version of such a frustrated system would be where you break some sort of composite object. Uh, and the name was pointed that this be a vestigial state where this composite is a vestige, a leftover of the initial state uh, that is still driving the underlying physics. All of this, at least to my knowledge and to my understanding, uh, was greatly impacted by a very, very beautiful and pioneering paper here by Premichandra, Pierce Coleman, and Anatoly Larkin a number of years ago, uh, where they looked at the J1, J2 Heisenberg model in two dimensions, uh, looked at a, inter, uh, at a diagonal coupling between spins that was larger than the nearest neighbor coupling and then you find that it's important that there's an additional Z2 symmetry where you have basically two classical ground states that are degenerate or even two quantum ground states that are degenerate. And uh, you can introduce based on the ordering state where you have antiferromagnetic ordering, say, in one direction or into an orthogonal direction, an order parameter weight for all, both of these configurations. And you can compose it into a composite object that is this Ising degree of freedom indicated here. If that Ising degree of freedom condenses, you have a real Ising phase transition. That was the title of that paper, even though you have a Heisenberg spin magnet. That's a pretty cool story. And with the discovery of the iron-based superconductors, this story was immediately recognized to be of importance for the onset of two subsequent phase transitions that you see here 
one that breaks the rotational symmetry, which is ultimately what this order parameter does, and then couples, of course, to the lattice, and the second one that breaks the actual magnetic uh, uh, time reversal symmetry and is the magnetic phase transition that follows up is the primary order parameter. But interestingly, you have that intermediate regime here. This object being and transforming like a second rank tensor must talk to every other second rank tensor that you have around. And the most straightforward one is, of course, the elastic tensor of a system. So you talk directly bilinearly to the deformation. And this is essentially how this transition was, of course, identified. But you can also use this bilinear coupling to identify and measure the pneumatic susceptibility of the sizing degree of freedom by just looking at an elastic constant. And this is something we looked at uh, very early. Uh, it was, uh, within the experimental work here was done by uh, David Mandrus and Willy Kappes and at Oak Ridge at a time. So you see the softening of the elastic constant, essentially the divergence of the pneumatic susceptibility as you approach that transition. And you have an idea that uh, there might be uh, some underlying pneumatic degree of freedom being critical. Uh, you can look at dynamical phenomena and an object that uh, is a dynamical quantity and couples to fluctuations of second rank tensors is a Raman spectroscopy. And again, you use the same types of logic and you can see that quite quantitatively, quite nicely, you can understand uh, the Raman spectra here. These are data by Rudi Huckel in Munich, the original investigation and, and, and a proposal to me measure Raman or use Raman to measure uh, these pneumatic fluctuations was done by Jan Galet and Raphael was a co-author too. And you see this works very, very nicely. And maybe one last comment on this iron-based story is that uh, uh, whether there's, that there is indeed a way by which you can pinpoint that there is a magnetic fluctuation, a primary order fluctuation causing the second rank tensor to condense. Uh, and uh, which is, uh, uh, if you have magnetic fluctuations, which you would, for example, measure through an NMR relaxation rate uh, measurement, and you could conceive that it impacts the pneumatic susceptibility because it's just a composite of the spin degrees of freedom and hence would impact the elastic constant. And in a work with Anna Böhmer and Christoph Meingaster and Raphael, a number of years ago, we made one specific assumption, otherwise you really can't make this work about the spin dynamics that was seen in neutron scattering data. And we could indeed make a connection between the elastic constant data, which are the lines shown here measured by Anna and Christoph and existing NMR data and there's really not much fitting going on here. You can make a one-to-one -one correspondence between magnetic fluctuations driving the lattice softening and the lattice softening as well, which sees, you see the fluctuation that cause that state to happen. There are other iron-based systems where this doesn't work quite as beautifully, uh, but it does work very nicely in these barium uh, one-to-two systems uh, that I've been showing you the phase diagram on earlier. To summarize, what happens is, as I said, you have a multi-component order parameter. You can build composites out of it. And if you want to know which symmetries am I really supposed to break here with composites, all you need to do, if it's a bilinear composite, you take the product of the representation and you check which non-trivial representation occur. And those are the ones that you can still break uh, at this upper transition and that could emerge. And those are the order parameters uh, that can individually condense without the primary order parameter being finite. Good. Now, with all this uh, in our mind, uh, there was an interesting question of whether one can see those vestigial phases, those composite orders in superconductors, not in the sense of the iron-based superconductors where ultimately what condensed was a composite of the magnetic order parameter, but really a composite of the superconducting order parameter. There was some theory work uh, before we looked into this. On the one hand, Mark Fisher and Eris uh, Barrett looked into a potential explanation for the uh, strain dependence of transition temperatures uh, in uh, a PX plus IPY superconductor at that time with the idea maybe to say something about transferosinate and also charge 4E superconductors can be conceived as composites uh, of uh, charge 2E superconductors quite naturally. A problem that one always has when you look at superconductors is that, well, they don't, this is all what I described as a fluctuation effect. And they don't fluctuate a whole lot uh, for the obvious reasons that the coherence length is often much larger than the Fermi wavelengths. And uh, that's why we were attracted um, 
by uh, looking at these uh, doped uh, bismuth serenite, uh, doped topological insulator that was found about 10 years ago to superconduct at around three Kelvin. And with the interesting aspect that it does so at a comparatively low carrier concentration. And if you use the HC2 values uh, and estimate the Fermi wavelengths from the usual and the quite well known band structure, you find that they are of the same order. So there is some hope that superconducting fluctuations in this system could be more important and relevant than in many other systems. So in order for this to work, you do need a two component order parameter. And this the underlying point geometry through with this trigonal has two options. Uh, one is um, a singlet or a triplet EG or EU or uh, com uh, two component order parameter where the two components are just given here and our basis functions are a little bit lengthier because of the point group of the system. Uh, and, and you find that regardless of whether this is odd or even pairing, you can make essentially a nematic or a chiral, a time reversal symmetry breaking superposition. Now this analysis and classification was done in this very pioneering early work by Liang Fu and Eris, where they uh, looked at the potential uh, relevance for topological superconductivity in these systems. So what we looked at is what, whether and what are the options for composite order in the specific system with a two component order parameter. And clearly, uh, if you look at, for example, the pneumatic state that will become relevant in a second, what you have is basically three uh, degenerate solutions uh, that are combinations of these two objects uh, that are allowed uh, near the phase transition as the relevant uh, superposition of the system. So you would then break a rotational symmetry in such a superconducting state, which is precisely what you see. Uh, these are data here by Guo uh, um, uh, where, where the NMR night shift was seen as function of uh, the field orientation. And we see that the three equivalent axes that you have um, are not equivalent anymore in the superconducting state. And you basically pick one out of those three and therefore you have a twofold symmetry breaking in the system. Um, this you would have and you only would have if it's one of those two uh, two dimensional representations in the system. This is a nematic superconductor. Uh, other experiments have seen uh, similar anisotropies. I'm just showing you one example. Heat capacity is function of the angle which is another thermodynamic measurement. And you also see this twofold uh, anisotropy in the system. There is also anisotropies of the upper critical field, which is an independent and quite interesting story. Again, you find a two-fold rotational symmetry breaking. OK, we know what to do. We have a point group. We have an order parameter. It's EU or EG. There's some evidence that it's actually an odd parity state. But for our purposes, this is not really relevant. Because both give us, as a product representation, two options for non-trivially transforming objects. One version would be that the system breaks time reversal symmetry. As some indications, this could actually be relevant in this system if you look at thin films. But uh, all uh, experimental indication and also theory uh, shows that the preferred state is this pneumatic state. It's a two-dimensional representation in its own way, where you have two non-trivially transforming composites that you can form and that you can build into a traceless uh, symmetric tensor, which is what you need for if you want to a two-dimensional pneumatic. If you expand the entire uh, collective field theory for those degrees of freedom, what you find after a little bit of calculation that from the microscopic on, you find that uh, the continuum field theory for this problem is that of a three-state POTS model, which is what you probably would be uh, expecting if you look at these three pictures here. So we have a three-state POTS model that in three dimensions uh, would have a first order transition in two dimensions, second order, maybe this order could also drive this first order transition, second order, but we have a three state POTS model transition as a potential composite order that could occur. We investigated this here with Matthias and analyzed the phase diagram and found that if you take into account fluctuations, uh, you find indeed that above the superconducting transition temperatures would be the superconducting order parameter, you do find this pneumatic uh, POTS order parameter to be finite. There's a first order transition um, at a finite pneumatic transition temperature. There's an intermediate pneumatic phase. That's what the theory says. Once you enter that phase, superconducting fluctuation will be vastly increased because the system now is much less frustrated. And you would also expect 
that there will be some lattice softening to, uh, going on, even though this is the first order transition, ultimately there will be no elastic constant going to zero. So we expect that there's a region above the superconducting phase transition where you expect an enigmatic phase that is not superconducting on its own right. Uh, some implication, maybe I'm just listing one, is that there should, because of the increased fluctuations, be paraconductivity that should even be anisotropic in the system in that intermediate regime that is much larger than what you would expect in the high temperature non pneumatic state. Truly what changes here is a condensation of fluctuations. When I presented those ideas uh, a while ago, um, probably two years ago, uh, at, um, uh, at, at a meeting in Beijing, Rolf Lortz uh, approached me because he had been doing experiments on niobium doped bismuth selenide, uh, where he looked at thermal expansion uh, in three different, for three different crystalline orientations in the system and found something quite intriguing. Uh, in the meantime, there are similar results also for different compositions, so this might well be something uh, generic. So what does he find? Um, thermal expansion measures the length change of the sample. Uh, this is the superconducting transition. It has a tiny heat capacity anomaly, which is ultimately not too surprising because we have a low carrier concentration. But above that transition, uh, one direction gets a tiny little bit shorter and the other two directions uh, get longer. Uh, and you've, you break the threefold rotation symmetry and you only have uh, one axis preferred compared to the other. What I find simply amazing is if you look at the numbers. So the relative length changes that are being measured here are 10 to the minus seven. So if you take the typical size of the unit cell, uh, the length changes induced by those superconducting fluctuations are of the border of a fraction of a femtometer, so a fraction of the size of the proton. Of course, this can be resolved because you ultimately accumulated over the sample size, but it's also tells that there's a tiny structural response to that system that breaks this rotation asymmetry. So what we see is, yes, we have a Z3 uh, symmetry breaking. We can call it Z3 pot symmetry breaking. What would be cool is if we could really make a case that this is a fluctuation induced effect. And then we uh, discussed this quite a bit. And indeed, if you, for example, look at the diamagnetic response of the system, the susceptibility itself, well, it becomes diamagnetic in the superconducting state as it's supposed to be. But if you then zoom in, then you see that the actual onset of diamagnetic fluctuation can already be seen at that upper transition temperature uh, which is precisely the one that you also see the symmetry breaking in the system taking place. And another measurement uh, more recently was uh, to look at paraconductivity. So again, this is the resistivity. Uh, this is the superconducting transition. And here we see the onset of uh, superconducting fluctuations impacting the resistivity at, uh, the, at the temperature where you also break the rotational symmetry. So there is therefore quite some evidence that indeed uh, we have a composite order building the fluctuations of the superconducting order parameter condense and superconducting fluctuations are being enhanced without actually causing superconducting symmetry breaking. Uh, maybe a last uh, experiment that you can look at is you can go to low temperatures and try to kill the superconducting state with the field. And then indeed you, what you see is that uh, the length changes uh, Go, recover and uh, so you go to the threefold symmetric state once you also go to a field that actually happens to be larger than the uh, HC2 field that you can independently measure. And if this is to be taken seriously, it would mean that the splitting persists even at lowest temperature and there would be an isolated Z3 quantum pots transition in the system uh, uh, taking place here. Of course, again, this is a first order transition at least uh, for a clean sample. So. The bottom line is um, I feel that this is uh, a very nice indication or maybe even evidence uh, that we have a system where the superconducting U1 symmetry is not broken. However, composites of the superconducting order parameter are finite at a finite distance uh, from the phase transition. This was uh, the first part and in the remaining uh, time I want to talk about uh, an idea that we have been playing around with recently with Roland, uh, Roland Villa and Rafael Fernandez to understand uh, some of the mysteries of the strontium ruthenate uh, time reversal symmetry breaking. And the proposal is um, uh, at first glance quite naive. The proposal is that this is actually a good old fashioned time reversal symmetric 
D-wave superconducting aura parameter. There's nothing boring about a D-wave superconducting aura parameter, but single component in the system. Something that uh, was also seen uh, to be the most compelling uh, scenario in recent quasi-particle interference data. And of course, you might ask, well, what is about the time reversal symmetry breaking? And the uh, statement that we are making is that uh, the time reversal symmetry breaking may well not be a bulk effect in the system. And I will discuss this in some detail. But in fact, uh, is something uh, where um, the system uh, has uh, local edge dislocations uh, and that you find a separate phase transition near edge dislocation that breaks uh, the time reversal symmetry in the system. So let's go a little bit over the data that we have to motivate this. Uh, some uh, quite recent review, and there's also a lot that happened since. For example, that uh, Stuart Brown and Andrei Pustigov and collaborators found uh, that uh, this is, seems to be much more likely to be a singlet pairing state than one used to think. And we also know from muon experiments that there is a superconducting transition under strain and a time reversal symmetry breaking transition uh, that is split by applying strain and uh, something that if you take them together might well be a good argument, for example, for a two-dimensional reducible representation such as an XZ plus IDYZ superconductor. And there are proposals for this one and proposals that go beyond this in taking into account orbital effects. But there's one issue one has to be paying attention to when you look at EG or EU two-dimensional irreducible representations. And it is that uh, if you have a splitting due to strain that is more or less symmetrical, you have, and you have two phase transition, and the order parameter transforms in the same representation, this is a statement that has been made uh, several times, and the heat capacity anomaly that at zero strain, you have at TC splits, and it should be more or less evenly split. In fact, if this curve here at the lower time reversal symmetric curve changes more slowly than the upper one, which by all means it seems to do, then the lower jump should be the larger one. So uh, if you look at the experiment, and here are data from the Dresden group, and I'm sure Andy is going to give us much more details on it, but there seems there is a very clear indication for the first trans jump of the heat capacity at the superconducting transition temperature and virtually nothing, and maybe something that they estimate to be less than 5% at the lower transition. To me, this means uh, the two-dimensional representation is not naturally explaining this type of behavior. The most promising candidate probably would be, if you take in all the data together, is uh, the one that put purport by, by one of the organizers here, Steve Gilbertson and his uh, collaborators, where you have an accidental degeneracy between a D and a G state that would could then uh, break time reversal symmetry. Now, there is, however, something that uh, one has to pay attention to if you look at the MUSR data, the ones that I showed you here that are responsible for this time reversal symmetry breaking, because A, there's quite a bit of sample dependence, as the authors, authors of this paper very clearly point out, uh, even of the splitting of these two transition temperatures, even at zero strain. And in addition, that the MUSR signal much more looks like that of a spin glass, only that it's much smaller in magnitude, and uh, stating themselves that uh, the signal itself, and that would uh, be the case even if the time reversal symmetry breaking might be involved, but the signal is due to some sort of defects, inhomogeneities, and so forth. So it's not obvious that this is a bulk signal, and also is not an indication for bulk time reversal symmetry breaking, I believe. So edge dislocation, which is what I uh, mentioned earlier, and what we propose here um, is something that has been seen in strontium rosinate quite a bit, and where the impact of it uh, was actually investigated a number of years ago, even pointing out that you would get, if you have a high concentration of them, local PC values or onsets of superconductivity that is at a much higher temperature, somewhere near what can be reached uh, with, uh, in a much more honest and beautiful way using homogeneous uniaxial strain. So there are those dislocations in the system, and they do couple strongly to superconductivity. So why is that so? Near such a dislocation, what you have is very, very strong local strain fields. So the stress here is about five gigapascal near such a dislocation, which is about five times of what the uniaxial strain measurements uh, usually uh, reach. And you get local tension and compression. 
And uh, if you have any of all kinds of symmetry realizations of, of strain in the system, among others, the one that you would need, for example, to couple D and G to take uh, the idea from three from collaborators uh, as a can candidate for two order parameters that are compelling. But what you don't need is that these two are almost degenerate. They can be actually vastly different in their onset temperature, but this very strong coupling mixes in the G order uh, with the D order right near the, uh, the dislocation borders naturally. And since there's tension and compression on either side, the relative sign of these two order parameters is actually the opposite one. And the magnitude of the mixed in component only decays with a power law, only like one over the distance from this point. If you then also had, for example, time reversal symmetry, which I'm gonna to get to right away, then you could also use existing strain fields that you would also have near that dislocation to tune and to train such a state uh, uh, with an external magnetic field. So the idea is now that you somehow need to make it as you go through from this side to that side of the dislocation to change the sign of the G component. And near TC, and we did a variational calculation for this problem, near TC what you find is that you just go to zero because you don't pay much penalty. But, uh, and the order parameter, this additional mixed in G component just shrinks to zero and changes its sign naturally. And at a lower temperature, you would naturally get um, a relative phase, so you go through the complex plane, uh, break time reversal symmetry in the system, uh, and uh, by this means uh, you would have locally um, currents going, uh, flowing in the system and have, have a local time reversal symmetry breaking at a lower temperature. The calculation we have done so far is, is under the condition that these are really split transition. This lower transition can move up by just increasing the desire of the system to break uh, time reversal symmetry and uh, the length scale over this uh, time reversal symmetry again would then increase significantly in the system. You can also look at local uh, current pattern that you would have that would flow up, up above and below those type of dislocations in the system. There's a, of course, with every theory there's a problem and the biggest problem we see with this approach is uh, that we have one uh, indication from true bulk measurements that uh, uh, says something about the nature of the pairing state, which are the elastic uh, constant discontinuity, particularly the one C66, uh, an elastic constant that transform non-trivially, not like A1G. And here in this uh, work by Brad Ramshaw and collaborators, we see that there is a discontinuity, you see it here, in this elastic constant. There's also work uh, from the uh, uh, Sherbrook group uh, where uh, in my view, quantitatively, a much smaller jump was been seen, and maybe some indication was seen of this one in earlier work. So uh, this is a strong indication for a two-component order parameter. Actually, the fact that there's no jump here even points much more towards the D plus IG story. But bottom line is, uh, this is not something that we would have in an ordinary D-wave superconductor. This, the only explanation, if you wanted to rescue the story I've just told you, is that it's actually known the disclinations and dislocations um, change the elastic constant uh, quite significantly. You need to know their density and size, but typically for even good materials, you find that there's a 2% up to 10% change in the elastic constants. And if you look at, for example, an elastic wave that goes with a C66 symmetry to the system, and it couples uh, to a dislocation with very strong strain fields, you would mix in other symmetries and you could inherit the jump that you have in uh, the trivial A1G channel in the system. Uh, maybe too constructed, maybe it's a realistic work. We need to uh, find out in more detail whether this is the right explanation, whether our theory can hold up to this one experimental objection that I see with this uh, scenario. And that already gives me my conclusion. Um, in both sy systems that I discussed, there were phase transitions, uh, it was a sequence of phase transitions, uh, but the underlying physics was completely different. I talked first about bismuth serenized, dope bismuth serenized as a beautiful example where you can see a composite order parameter of a superconducting order parameter condensing, breaking an individual symmetry, and therefore there's a burden sharing that the U1 symmetry is only broken at the TC, but is below the actual pneumatic. <clears throat> sorry, pneumatic or Z3 pots transition that you see in that system. And in the second part, uh, we uh, propose some ideas uh, that um, 
could uh, reconcile the complete absence of a heat capacity anomaly uh, at the time reverse asymmetry transition, something that to me tells me there is no bulk transition taking place. And uh, also the broad distribution of fields that are actually seen in MUSR that are much more indicative of inhomogeneous systems and claim that maybe transient rusinate is quote unquote only a D-wave superconductor with a single component. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you, Jörg. Uh, so I'm gonna pass the name of everyone. So if you have questions, please uh, raise your hand and I will call them. So the first question here is by Rudra Biswas. Uh, go ahead, you can unmute yourself. Huh, what happened to you? I think you disappeared from my... Okay, ah, I see you don't have the mic. So I'm just gonna repeat the question that you asked here. So Woodrow asked in the chat, do experiments, I, I believe he's referring to the bismuth selenide part yeah. of your talk. Do experiments show the nematic state forming in all possible all directions when the same sample is thermally cycled across the transition multiple times? Oh no, this is a big mystery in the system. And thanks for pointing it out because I should have done it. Uh, uh, so, uh, there is, um, if you cycle the system, uh, you usually fall back to the same state, which means, um, and the only natural, so you, there, there are some experiments with domains. Uh, they, they occur very rarely, um, but you do see them. Uh, but what you don't see is uh, that you thermally cycle and then randomly pick spontaneously another of those three directions. It never happens, and it uh, was a very careful investigation also by Christine Villa at that time at Argon uh, to, to uh, investigate this. It usually memorizes uh, somehow uh, that the system must have some internal strain. There's something funny about this trigonal symmetry. Any inhomogeneous strain in the system that is not A1G couples to that stupid order parameter. So uh, one way, and the only way I see to explain this is that uh, there is some preferential axis already in the system. You don't truly break asymmetry, uh, but you can still have a sharp phase transition because it's first order, of course. All right, so uh, next question is by uh, Stuart Brown. So, uh, your does uh, do the scanning squid measurements uh, from uh, Catherine Muller's group pose any challenge for what you're describing? if she could see edge dislocations. However, they are usually buried. So, I mean, it would be wonderful, for example, if, this, uh, if you could see the edge dislocation with, um, uh, and, and she must uh, answer better than I can whether uh, what's the uh, uh, horizontal depths of her experiments, how deep can she see? Uh, but I don't know the answer. I ask myself the same, but I don't quite know the answer, and it's uh, the right question to ask her. Uh, all right. Uh, next question is by uh, Pavel Volkov. Uh, hello. My question is uh, re with regard to <clears throat> the first half of your talk. So you yep. mentioned that the coherence lens is of the order of the Fermi wavelength in, 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 in this uh, doped bismuth uh, selenide. Yes. So the question is that... Uh, this is also a conventional criterion for the superconductor being strong coupling. So my question is, uh, is there any evidence for some kind of non-Gaussian superconducting fluctuations apart from the pneumatic transition? Is there any pseudo gap? Is there anything that tells you that it's a strong coupling superconductor since the coherence lenses of the order of the lambda Fermi? Yeah. So um, there's... Let me think whether the, sometimes you see from the temperature panels of the upper critical field, uh, whether you have a strong coupling superconductor, because I mean, you, it, it is not quite trivial to disentangle all these phenomena because as you said, well, there's this pneumatic story going on at the same time. Um, uh, but I, uh, so honestly, I would expect this to be a, a strong coupling superconductor. I would have no problems with this. Uh, it makes, perfect sense to me. I do not know about a clear-cut experiment that has seen that. Okay, I'll ask uh, everybody to raise their hand. All, all, I don't know what happened, but all hands were lowered. Uh, but I have here in my list Oscar Wafek is the next one. 
Um, hi, Jörg. Uh, is there a hi, simple Oscar. way to understand why the vestigial order in the bismuth selenite um, system is nematic and not timorous symmetry breaking? Ah. Um, so, uh, so how d all these calculations, the first calculation um, along those lines were actually done, let me go back here, by Jorn van der Boers and uh, Liam Fu. Uh, we reproduced everything that they did. Uh, and um, uh, what you do is you, you calculate with a recoupling calculation uh, the essentially ginsburg lander parameters. Let me just try to find whether I see. Uh, I want to find the specific slide here. Yeah, um, and you need to calculate certain ginsburg lander parameters, not the one I've shown here, but of the actual superconducting aura parameter, and a given sign tells you what it is, and this is given by the electronic structure. Um, what, uh, uh, what was done here by uh, Luca Ciroli is to, for example, look at um, thin films and two-dimensional systems, uh, and you find that uh, depending on the... Uh, velocity pointing in the in the third direction, uh, you find a transition to an, from a chiral to a pneumatic state. Um, this is uh, ultimately what you get by taking a couple of momentum integrals. I honestly, I, I asked myself this several times, why is this the case? Because most often you find that uh, you break time reversal symmetry with those types of arguments. Um, it It happens to be uh, the more three-dimensional electronic structure that supports the pneumatic state, but this, I, I don't think, can be called uh, an explanation. It just comes out of the stupid calculation. Thank you. Just a uh, quick compliment. I, I believe yeah. that the key role there is played by the spin orbit coupling being significant in the system. But uh, in the absence of the authors... Oh, yeah, you always... I mean, you cannot do the, any calculation here without spin orbit coupling because of this. This is... Uh, in all calculations, you need to do this under the spin orbit coupling, yeah. Uh, we have a question. Uh, Daniel Ekterberg, I don't think he can raise his hand because he's a panelist, but uh, Daniel, you can unmute yourself and ask the question uh, to, to York. Thanks, Raphael. Uh, that was a very nice talk, York. Um, I had one question about the Stronten ruthenate part. Uh, in the theory you have, uh, in the unstrained samples, um, broken time versal symmetry seems to set at the same temperature as superconductivity. Yes. Is that easy to understand with your explanation using of uh, not. these discussions? And it's a very good question. And the only way I can. Uh, uh, so, what? No, we don't have an explanation uh, for that. Uh, why would there be a degeneracy between these two temperatures? Um, the only statement may, I may want to make is if you look at these three samples, these are the unstrained samples. Uh, and I hope uh, that Andy is going to make some more detailed and uh, qualitative comments on this, but there are samples where you even seem to be seeing, and this is what the authors say here, a quarter Kelvin above TC, uh, the time reversal symmetry breaking, ultimately meaning you have local regions where you're maybe, maybe already in a superconducting state and then break time reversal symmetry there. You have it half a Kelvin below TC and you have it at TC. So maybe we need to uh, be... Uh, questioning these very statement that these are two degenerate states at uh, zero strain. Okay, thank you. Okay, you Yushuan Wang, you can unmute yourself. I just have a quick clarification question to ask. So you mentioned when you were talking about this, uh, this location time reversal breaking, um, I yeah. think the picture is on one side of the dislocation, the order parameter is D plus G, the other side is D minus G. Yeah, I was just yes. wondering whether there is any uh, either microscopic or phenomenological uh, argument for this, uh, far away from yeah. the dislocations? Thanks. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is, sorry, I was probably too quick. So you have a dislocation here. The dislocation field um, induces local dis displacements and strain fields. Uh, and it does so essentially depending on the orientation of the dislocation in all uh, symmetry channels you can think of. Um, among others, also, for example, if you look at D and G in the uh, B2G uh, symmetry channel. So, therefore, you have a bilinear coupling between these two order parameters, and uh, it would, uh, therefore, you would naturally mix in G. In addition, when you go to the left or to the right of a, of a dislocation, you would 
either have tension or compression. Uh, so therefore, the sign of the coupling changes if you go from the left to the right. Uh, and, and that's ultimately and directly gives you d plus g if you're far away on the one side and d minus g if you're far away on the other side. Right, but then you would need to assume far away from this dislocation, uh, this epsilon xy would die off, right? Otherwise, it dies off uh, only as one over r. Uh -huh. So it dies off very slowly. Okay, so then if I take a, a connection, contour going from positive to negative without penetrating this dislocation, then this relative sign would, uh, in one component should go to zero in between? I didn't quite catch the question, sorry. The thing is, if I uh, take a contour going from the D plus G side to D yes. minus G side without yeah. going through directly the dislocation, would yes. you expect one of the components just continuously goes through zero? Okay, uh, there are two ways. Either you are near the dislocation, you don't need to be in this very plane, because again, in all directions, this train decays like one over R, uh, with a sign change along the Z direction here. So hmm. if you go up here from D plus G to D minus G, uh, you would still have the same situation. If you go even further away, then the problem is mute because there's no G anymore. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, Andre. Trubukov, you can you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, okay, uh, same question as Yushan asked, but in a more simple form. Uh, you said that the, basically works with D plus IG. How important for your analysis is that the second component is A to G, or more it specific, not a, yeah. the second it, component is B to G. Is there any way to couple it with yeah. D squared minus Y squared? So okay. Uh, let's go here. So D plus G or D plus IS would do the same job. Both would behave very much the same. And if you really, you could even be uh, um, ambitious and say the difference to uh, identify which one is the right one is to do an SDM me measurement and see whether you open a gap or not because one have, would have nodes and one not near that uh, time, in this time reverse symmetry breaking region. If you have D plus ID, uh, mm -hmm. It would still potentially work, but you couldn't train it anymore with a magnetic field because uh, there's no symmetry uh, combination I can come up with where the given strain couples uh, to a magnetic field. So, yeah. and I assume that mm -hmm. uh, Aaron would never have seen that behavior in his uh, experiment initially if it wasn't trainable. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have a question. I, uh, all the panelists cannot raise their hands, so I'm, I'm calling their questions uh, uh, in the order I'm receiving. So, Steve, you're next. Uh, okay, good. Uh, so, first place, it, it, it seems to me that probably these are not totally distinct uh, uh, proposals that somehow for this, for the G component to be significant by the strain, it has to be close to. Uh, ordering on its own. Correct. But, but I, had, I had a specific question. Uh, presumably, it should be possible to change the concentration of dislocations. Even yes. if one can't get rid of them, one could presumably yes. purposely include, introduce more dislocations to see yes. whether dislocations are playing a key role. In that sense, this is a falsifiable scenario, but uh, this, I believe, has not been done. This, yeah, just, just to compliment Steve, this could, this may be possible to be done using plastic deformation. Yeah. Uh, because then you control, you go beyond, yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, it's not it's been, the experimentalists to, you know, wreck their beautiful crystals. <laughs> yeah, right. Need, and, yeah, exactly. Uh, Jan Zanen, you had, uh, you had your, your, when his hand raised here, but I cannot see you anymore. Please text me if you still want to ask your question. Meanwhile, uh, by text, I mean chat here. Arun has a question. He doesn't have a microphone, so I'm just going to uh, read Arun Paramekanji's question. Uh, uh, he's wondering uh, if studying exposed step edges will also help address this proposal since uh, they're in some sense a partial dislocation. Yeah, uh, what matters is the induced strain at the step uh, this, uh, step edge, 
um, ultimately that's what we need to, and the way I understand it is that the induced strain at the step edge is significantly smaller than at a dislocation, so it may come down to an issue of numbers. My, so I, I, I don't think that you get quite uh, as long as large a strain value there, and uh, you need that in, uh, unless, of course, uh, when these two states are really almost degenerate, and then it should work. So, yeah, it's, it, it's getting maybe a, a matter of details, whether or not, my suspicion is whether or not. Okay, uh, Jan Zanin, uh, if you're there, I, um, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, uh, Kevin. Hi, Jörg. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, hi, Jörg. Uh, can you go back to that slide where you introduced the medic order part with del x dot del x minus del y del y? Uh, this will won't be very long. Yeah, that's all. Right, so um, I can read it physically as its amplitude channel, right? So you get kind of a stronger pairing in one direction and the other direction, Correct. and that puts DC4 symmetry. Now, the simple question I bet you have thought hard about it is um, we repeat the Armitage, right? And uh, say the stairs, but spectroscopy is a very powerful way of uh, looking at the subconductor. Uh, would you expect there that? Uh, with these kind of experiments, you can actually pick up directly that you are dealing with this kind of pneumatic subconductivity. And perhaps, you know, when you are in a pneumatic phase without subconductivity, look at the fluctuations to learn a lot of interesting things. Well, in particularly in this intermediate phase. But of course, keep in mind, you need to do a measurement in this specific sample uh, yeah. within half a Kelvin. Uh, but, uh, of course, this is a very strongly fluctuating superconductor that fluctuates in a highly anisotropic way, and it must therefore have an anisotropic optical response, among others, yeah. of course. Um, I, yeah. Just interrupt for a second. I mean, mm -hmm. the thing that I don't, I'm not quite sure about is the uh, currents are really governed by the phase stiffness, right? And I guess that in order to the, decide about the anisotropy you pick up in uh, Conductivity, it has to be that the phase stiffness is anisotropic. Uh, is that completely obvious how it works in this? Oh, phase? it's much more trivial. You're actually breaking a symmetry. Um, yeah. And uh, so if I go back the, uh, for a trigonal system, uh, yeah. you would have, say, the resistivity along this direction, along yeah. the y direction, are actually the same. Um, but now we talk about. They would just be different. Yeah, now it's a more of a technical point, right? That the, uh, as uh, superfluid density, the strength of the superconductor is set by the phase sector, by the phase yes. stiffness, right, or by the amplitude sector. So yes. to translate it's a bit like, you know, you look at a uh, spinomatic blah blah spin system, and then the yes. size uh, of things would determine uh, your order parameter, and that impacts, of course, in the strength of exchange interaction setting you, your yeah. uh, spin velocity, blah blah. Do you any clue how that would work? And My suspicion is really you have a certain direction in which you essentially have an amplitude of the order parameter set. Yeah. Uh, it's just still phase fluctuating. That's what really what's happening, right? Um, but in, I'm, I'm uh, talking in, about, you know, how you pick it up in the experiment, right? How the conductivity, as, you know, the superconducting conductivity, uh, so Peter Armitage, hangs together with the order parameter. You, what, what you have and to do is, right? so again, in the pneumatic phase, uh, what you need to do, and only there can you make a symmetry statement, uh, you would just m measure uh, sigma xx and sigma yy, and you I take the imaginary part and look at yeah. one over omega contribution, it has to be different. Yeah, but the question is how large is the difference, given that your order parameter uh, uh, is this and that, how can you predict what the, uh, superfluid density would do in the different directions? I would expect that, uh, so, so you have a certain axis that is, uh, that is your, uh, your preferred axis where you basically have a well-defined amplitude, and I would expect the phase fluctuations to be larger in the orthogonal axis, uh, but uh, we haven't actually done the calculation. Yeah. Right, so it's kind of interesting, I guess, to work yeah, it out in a very detail. Question. So it's yeah. a technical point, yeah. Okay. So uh, I, uh, I think we are uh, out of time for more questions. Uh, I'll thank you, Oregon, in the name of everyone for, for a nice talk.